Good day, brothers and sisters, and welcome once again to the CMI School of Christ. And uh, we're back. <laughs> we're back from our time in Mexico, our Bible conference time there. And um, I just want to say thank you to all you who, uh, who were praying during that time for myself, praying for me, and praying for the students. <clears throat> It was really good. I really believe that the mind of the Lord was, was conveyed uh, to all of us who were present there during that time. And uh, I just wanted to just mention a little bit about it. It's still hot down there. <laughs> it being September, it's still hot. It was definitely hot while I was still there. And um, we just, what we try to do, we, we try to go there uh, twice a year at the very beginning of their semester. So uh, their actual first week of classes is this current week. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, last week is, I guess, registration time on, on Monday and Tuesday. And, you know, students still, you know, trickle in, or shall I say new students, uh, throughout that whole entire week. But one of the things that we really try to do uh, with that, and, you know, the, the academic uh, director Pablo Ledesma, he's the one who set it up this way, was that for at the beginning of every semester to have this gospel being declared. And so it's the very first thing that the students hear when they come to this Bible school. And, and to me, that's a great thing, you know. Uh, as, as we continue throughout the semesters, well, of course, uh, you know, I, I, teach a, I teach a Bible class with the students there. I'm still declaring the same. But it's, it's a very rare thing, and I know I've shared this before. It's a very rare thing where you can go to a Bible school and hear this gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of the person of Christ himself being declared. It's a very rare thing. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I tell the students, uh, and I continue to tell the students, is that the whole purpose for their soul existing is so that God can reveal the one who is present in the soul. That's it, Christ. Now, for that to happen, that person, that soul, must be born again. Because if, if they're not born again, then Christ isn't present in the soul. He's not present in the land. So, first and foremost, that soul must be born again. But they are born again with purpose. And see, that's the thing. The purpose was before the soul ever was. That's, and you know, we've, we've been seeing it throughout our uh, classes with Abram. Purpose was established way before God had a natural creation. And uh, so I tell that to the students. You know, I, I, I mean, I. I tell them clearly the purpose for the class that I have with them. And ultimately, I, I share them with, with them as well, that ultimately God doesn't care, you know, what class they passed during their time in Bible school. God doesn't really care whether they got an A, B, or C, or D, or F. God doesn't care what they learned. God doesn't care about anything except his son, and making his son known in the soul. That's all he cares about. Everything, everything of God was and is created for his son. And this is an awesome thing, an awesome thing. So many times what we end up doing is, uh, especially when we're first born again and you know, this happened to me way long, way long before I ever went to Bible school, way long ever before I ever heard the gospel of God. And see, that's another thing. Uh, the gospel of man, you know, is about Jesus. The gospel of God is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God himself. A huge difference. So the gospel is not only for those who are not born again, the gospel is for those who are born again because the gospel is for the soul. Christ is for the soul. Now, what I was going to say a while ago is that it's not so much what we get, though we do. Uh, I know when I was first born again, it was declared, okay, now you need to seek the Lord, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you need to 
get this gift and get that gift and get this by faith and get that by faith and get this and get that and and then declare what you got basically well have we ever thought or even considered not so much what we ourselves are getting from God but what the son receives of his father has it ever actually entered into our mind or have we actually contemplated or thought about not so much what we are getting and receiving but what the son himself receives of his father and see that's the thing even even with our with our whole the classes that we've been having concerning abram Abram, at this point where he's, where he's at with the Lord, he knows that it's about a father and a son. And unto the son, there is an inheritance. That inheritance being the land. And what the son receives, Christ himself, is our soul. Our soul is his inheritance. For him to abide in his inheritance is for first again, first, well, once again, first and once again, the soul must be born again. Now, even as uh, the Lord was speaking to the children of Israel and before that, you know, I'm giving you the land, uh, it's yours. But then he reiterates it to Joshua and he says it this way. Any place where the sole of your foot shall step, I've given it unto you. Well, right there, Joshua is a type of the head of the body. And basically what, what, what that means, what, that whole declaration unto Joshua is basically this. Anywhere you appear in the land, you govern. Life governs. Light governs. Righteousness governs. God governs, peace governs, all these things in the person of Christ himself, because that where, where, where Christ appears, Christ governs, and that is the kingdom of God in the soul, all right? So this is really, first and foremost, with what the Son himself is receiving, the soul, his inheritance. And I know that uh, we've, we've seen it with the, with the whole passage so far with Abram. You know, and, and I will say this, when, when Abram, when the Lord brought Abram and Abram finally comes into the land of Canaan, comes to Shechem, Sichem, and the Lord appears, then that is governing Abram. And the more that Abram continues in the appearing of the Lord, then more of the Lord is governing Abram. More of the glory of God is governing Abram because it is the God of glory appeared unto our father Abram when he was in Ur, Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. More of the glory of God is governing during this time. And that's, that's the whole thing, the whole picture right there. And at that moment, when the Lord appears, he governs what is rightfully his. And that's his inheritance. And unto us, it is his appearing is unto us the salvation of the land. Think, think about this. King Solomon, who's a beautiful type of the risen Christ. Beautiful. And yet, when he sits upon his throne, Peace governs the land. There were never any wars when King Solomon sat upon his throne. There were never any this, that, or the other. No. His, his name is rest. The land had rest when Solomon was upon the throne. There's no more to be done when Solomon is upon the throne. It is all finished. And now it is the rule and reign of wisdom righteousness of Christ himself, whom Solomon is a type of. And during this time, well, with the, with the testimony of Solomon, the whole land has rest and is at peace. 
and it's governed by wisdom. This is his inheritance. It's his inheritance in the saints. Unto us, unto the land, it is the salvation of the land. The land experiencing its salvation, its life, its righteousness, who is Christ. Okay, so um, <laughs> forgive me for, you know, uh, going off on a tangent a little bit, but uh, I, I continually share with the students there that that's ultimately what it's about. God desires to show his son as only he himself can show him. Not as man can learn by study, uh, by searching. No, no, as only God himself can reveal him to be, can reveal his son to be in the soul. So I tell that to the students just, you know, so they can, so they can have that expectation birthed in their own heart. Remember, once again, with Abram, God didn't tell Abram one thing and then change his mind because Abram came short of what God originally told him. God doesn't uh, show up on the scene to, to address a situation. God doesn't say like, oh no, something happened. Now I need to, to get everyone back on track and so I'll do this. No. The Lord declares purpose from the very beginning and He continues to declare, to declare, to declare purpose throughout because the purpose is to come to the end. And it's not an end like uh, to come to the finish line and then that's it. No, it's to come to the end like a purpose, like a goal set forth. And we come in our hearts again and again and again and again. And the way we come is simply this, the heart turns to the Lord, that's it. That's how we come to the Lord. It's when the heart turns to the Lord. Now, Abram took a, uh, a natural journey. We have no natural journey to take because the Lord is present in the land. The thing is, we are just ignorant of him who is present. But God desires to reveal the one who is present. Get thee out from and come unto a land that I will show thee. And the land that God shows, once again, is the land that is full of his glory, the land that is full, full, that is filled with God himself, the Lord himself. So I tell this to the students, and I'm obviously telling it to you all as well, because this is really what all, what the Lord, this is what he, this is what he desires. This is what governs the heavenlies. This is literally what it is all about. All right. <clears throat> so I want to go ahead and just continue uh, with our class here. And I know I've kind of been touching on some things uh, of, the, of our class for today. And, uh, but I just did want to say that we're back from Mexico and it was a really good time. And once again, thank you for all those uh, who prayed. I'll be shooting out an email with a link to the uh, sessions for those of you who speak Spanish. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and continue with Genesis chapter 15. We're going to start off with uh, verse 1. We're going to go ahead and read verse 1 through verse 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless and childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Basically, a servant, a slave. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth, the Lord brought Abram forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall seed be. And he and Abram believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him for righteousness. Okay, I know we read this passage before, 
but just the way the Lord was putting it on my own heart was basically this. Abram knew to some degree what it now all was about. He knew that throughout the land he would continue to discover the Lord who is present. He knew that the land was for his seed, for the seed, specifically seed of God. The Apostle Paul picks it up in Galatians, you know, and to Abram and his seed were the promises given, not seeds, plural as in many, but seeds, singular, masculine, individual, one, which seed is Christ himself. So Abram knew something of the whole purpose of the land. Now, it, it's not so much what Abram would receive, but what the seed of God would receive. So, here's Abram, he's just a man, uh, and yet he is a great testimony, first and foremost of Christ, and then of one coming to purpose and continuing in the purpose of God for which God created the soul, all right? Now, right here, there's just a couple things that I want us to take note of. It's in verse 1 and verse 4. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. And then in verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. Now, I'll, I, I'll, I'll just, I will just say this. What is more important, to hear the words of a man of a person or to hear the word of God. Obviously, to hear the word of the Lord, the word of God, because man can declare what he has seen of Christ in the scripture. Man can declare what he has seen in the face of Christ himself, God the Father revealing his son in the soul of that person. Man can declare with words, man can testify with words what he has seen. And with the natural ear, man can hear and understand that testimony. It goes as the words of man are external. They go as far as the natural ear, the natural mind. When God speaks, God declaring, um, God speaking his word, God speaks his word to the heart. God is speaking his word to the heart, but with purpose. With, it's always with purpose. When God speaks to the heart, it's with purpose. And I'll, get, I'll show it to you right here. With John on the Isle of Patmos, I heard the voices like John chapter 1, or excuse me, uh, the, the book of Revelation chapter 1. I heard the voice that spake with me. He heard the Lord. And I turned to see the voice. And then he goes on to say, and when I saw him. And that is the whole purpose of the Lord speaking to the heart, that the heart would turn to see the voice that is speaking. That's all that God does. That's, that's why we have the scripture. That is why we have the testimony of Christ right here. That is why we search the scriptures. That is why we study. That is why we search. It's so that we may hear the word of the Lord so that our heart may turn to see the voice the Word Himself, God's revealed. When God speaks, listen, when God speaks His perfect Word in our heart, in our soul, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is God speaking His perfect Word. This is God revealing, making known His perfect Word, His Logos or Lagos, depending on how you want to pronounce it. This is God making known His Son. Man cannot do this. This is 
of God himself. God does this. Man doesn't do this. Man cannot take credit for any of this. God alone can do this. Just like it requires a miracle to be born again, it requires a miracle of God. It also requires a miracle of God to reveal the life of the new birth, to reveal the Son that is now present in the soul. It's all a miracle of God. It's a beautiful, beautiful miracle. Man can take no credit. Man can have no boast in this because it wasn't man's work. It wasn't man's doing. All right? So right here, it's just really neat how the Lord says, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. And it's all with purpose. It's all so that the heart may come, so that the heart may turn unto Christ himself. And it's, it's beautiful. I mean, that is the whole purpose of the testimony. And I've, I've said this before. If the thing, whatever it is, is of God, is permitted of God, is allowed of God, it is to serve the purpose of God. And the purpose of God is his son to appear where he is. Now, the testimony and everything given of God, everything allowed of God, serves that purpose, which is the heart turning unto the Lord to behold the one who's present. Okay, this verse, it's John chapter 5, verses 39 and verse 40. I, I know by now it's probably memorized. Jesus said this to the Jews who are present, I know that you search the scriptures. You're searching the scriptures, and then he says this, because in the scriptures, in the testimony, you think you have eternal life by what you read, by what you study, by what you try to obey, by what you try to live by. You think you have eternal life by what you try to do. And then Jesus says this, and they, the scriptures, the Bible, they testify of me. Their whole purpose is to testify of Christ. And then he says this, he says this, he says this, he makes known the purpose of the testimony. He says this, and you will not come to be. The purpose of the testimony is to bring unto Christ, to bring unto him, to behold him who is present. The whole purpose of the scripture, that, that, that is it. It's not to learn, to study, to be more like Jesus, or to be an outstanding citizen of the community. It's not to go out and help the world be a better place to live. The purpose of the scripture is not any of that. Though man, because with man it's many, man will say, yes, we are to do this, we are to do that, we are to be better people. And they use the scripture to do that. Well, that's not the purpose of the scripture. The purpose of the scripture with God, it's always singular, one. One God one Father, one faith, one hope, one church, one Son, one Christ, one purpose, one mind, one will. We can go on and on and on. The scriptures are of God, given of God, to serve his purpose, and they serve a purpose to bring to the person of Christ. That's what they're for. That's what they're for. See, we can read and study and search the scriptures and believe, well, I'm coming to know the Lord more. I'm knowing God, but God cannot be known with the natural mind. I think it was the Apostle Paul who said this. He said, uh, in the wisdom of man, or man in man's wisdom, knew not God. Do we, do we remember the whole situation with the Tower of Babel? Man joined with one purpose, to attain unto God, to attain unto the wisdom of God, to attain unto the knowledge of God. They were all working together, and yet they all come short. If God does not reveal his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, then 
he is not known, period. Jesus said this, no man knows the Father, or, or no man knows the Son except the Father, and no man knows the Father except the Son, and he to whom he will reveal him. No man knows except he is revealed of God. No man knows the Father, and no man knows the Son, except God reveal him unto that one. Then wherein is our boast? Certainly not in what we have done. And if we do have any boast in what we have done, then it's certainly not in knowing God. Because once again, God cannot be known by man's effort or by man's energies. He can only be known if he is revealed of God himself, if he is made known by God himself. Then truly, the only boast man could ever have is in that our boast is in the Lord, in that the Lord, in it, how, just the way the Apostle Paul said it, in that it pleased God to reveal his son in me where he is therein is our boast our boast is in the lord all right so right here with abram as a man he's heard from god he has uh to some degree an understanding of what it's all about it's about a father and a son and what the son receives the inheritance that the son receives. And see, that's another thing. When God makes known his son, it's not now my understanding. No, it's the understanding of God governing my heart. It's the wisdom of God governing my heart because God knows the son and the son knows his father. The father knows the son and the son knows his father. And that wisdom is what governs the heart, the land, the soul. So if God makes known the one whom he knows to be present, then it's, no, it's, it's, it's not my knowing. My knowing is ignorance of the one who is present. My knowing is vanity, ignorant, ignorance, uh, imagination, of the one I believe to be present in the land, in the soul. But God knows the truth because God knows his son who is the truth. And Jesus told the woman at the well, you know, he, the woman who was drawing water from the well, he said this, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask me and I would give you but the whole fact of the time, of, of that moment, was that she was ignorant of the gift of God. She was ignorant of the one who was present in the midst. She had no clue who was present. So Abram, at this point with Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, uh, he knows to some degree the mind of the Lord, the purpose of the Lord. It all revolves around a seed, a son, and his inheritance. And see, the thing is, is that, and this happens to us all, I mean, by, by default, by nature, our heart is turned away from the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is continually working preparing the ground of the heart so that the heart can turn unto the Lord. The very first time the heart turns unto the Lord, then that soul, that person is born again because Christ appears in the soul where he was not before. Now, life is present, salvation is present, everything of God is present because the Son himself is present in the soul. The Spirit of the Lord continues doing the very exact same thing, now preparing the ground of the heart again, so that the heart may turn again, listen to it, the second. But now this time, 
to behold the one who is present because by nature, by default, we're beholding ourselves, beholding, well, beholding something less than Christ himself, beholding something less than the Son of God himself who's present. So the Spirit of the Lord continues faithful unto the Son, faithful unto purpose, preparing the ground of our heart that it may turn yet again. And when the heart finally turns to the Lord, we behold him, the second, the Lord from heaven even the salvation of our soul. And we experience, we, 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 we experience the salvation of our soul, the salvation that has been there the moment of new birth. Since the moment of new birth, we begin to experience, we begin to know the salvation that is present. And, uh, <clears throat> and it continues yet again and again and again. And I love, I love this. Uh, it's Acts chapter 26, Verse 16, this is James Murdoch's translation of the Syriac Peshito. This is when uh, the Lord appeared to Saul of uh, Tarsus and when he is, during his conversion to Paul. And he says this, I have appeared unto thee, not a message, not a teaching, not something from man, not something you've conceived, not something you've contrived, not something you've studied, not something you've learned. Because he sat at the feet of Gamaliel the greatest teacher among the Jews of the time and possibly all time, okay? But the Lord says this, I have appeared unto thee to constitute thee a minister and a witness of this, of the following of this, thy seeing me and of thy seeing me hereafter from this moment onward it is a continual beholding of the one who is present, a continual turning of the heart to behold the one who is present. It is what we could call the walk of faith, a walk of faith, a walk in the light, walking in the light, walking in truth. All these things you could you can call it. All these things that are these different uh, phrases that are found in the scripture. A walk of obedience, walking in purpose, walking in the will of the Lord, walking in the mind of the Lord. It's all, it's all there because the heart continues turning to behold the one who's present. And we, we've seen that with Abram. Now we know that, you know, by nature, by default, man just kind of wanders from purpose. I mean, he begins outside a purpose, the Lord brings him unto purpose, and, the len and then the Lord causes him to serve that purpose in his generation. And we've seen it with Abram, he just kind of wanders, and that's what we do. We do, our heart, as I stated once again, it, by default it turns away from the Lord. It's the Lord himself who brings the heart back once again. So wherein is boasting? Our boast is in the Lord and what he hath done and what he does. Okay, so here with this Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 through 6, Abram is somehow to some degree possibly abiding in the natural. I know it's about a seed. I just don't see the seed. The only thing I see is this servant. The servant, this one is destined to be the heir. Because once again, that's, that's the customs of the time. The servant was, if there was no natural seed, then the inheritance went to the head servant of the family. This, this time it's Eliezer. And so that's what's disturbing Abram's heart. And thank God that he brings it to the Lord. He just didn't, okay, well, I guess this is just how it's going to be. No, no. Something was, was upsetting his heart. Something was, was uh, disturbing his heart, and he brought that to the Lord. He presented what was governing his heart unto the Lord, okay? So I love this. The Lord doesn't change as I stated at the, at, the get, at the very beginning of this class, he doesn't, he doesn't see a situation and say, oh, okay, now I need to address this situation. And then another situation arises, oh, okay, now I, I need to address this other, complete other different situation. No, 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 no. 
He can, he's continually declaring purpose. Continually, right? The Lord, um, verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And the Lord brought Abram forth abroad. And this is where we're at right now. The Lord himself brought him forth, brought him out, because somehow his heart was beginning to dwell beneath, below, right? Found in the natural. The Lord brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven. Lift up the eyes of the heart. Lift up the eyes of, understand, of the understanding. Lift up the eyes of the soul. Lift up thine eyes. And tell the stars if thou be able to number them. Count the stars. Lift up your eyes and see the fullness that filleth, if it can be numbered at all. If you can number the fullness that's present, do it. But you can't. The Lord was showing him the glorified seed, the seed in increase. Remember, it took about 400 years being in Egypt, being in a type of burial, for the Lord to have somewhat of a testimony of his risen Christ. It took 400 years to have somewhat of a testimony of the increase of Christ, the resurrection, the glorified seed. And right here, the Lord is speaking to him. Lift up your eyes. Behold the increase that filleth. Behold him that filleth. And see if you can, how should I say it? See if you can measure the fullness that filleth. See if you can measure the increase of this one. Abram, once again, saw the resurrection. Abram saw Christ himself in resurrection. Abram saw the seed glorified the glorified seed. And he said unto him, so shall seed be, even so. Verse 6, And Abram believed in the Lord. But why did he believe? He believed because he saw the increase of Christ. He believed because he saw the resurrection. He believed because he saw the risen Lord. He believed because he saw. And I, I know uh, here in the United States of America, uh, North America, we, we say, you know, we, we've said it, seeing is believing. And then we say, no, well, us, you know, the, the, the church at large says, no, no, you have to just believe without seeing because that's faith. Believing without seeing is faith. Well, no, uh, let me just clarify the whole, the whole issue right there. Abraham, or Abram, excuse me, during this time, Genesis chapter 15, he's still Abram. Abram saw Christ, the resurrection, and therefore he believed. And that, seeing this one, resulted in believing in the Lord. And this believing was counted to him for righteousness. And I'll say this, seeing is believing. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith, this is true faith. Abram, Abraham, the father of faith, the father of the faithful, the one who continued in the appearing of the Lord. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the substance of expectation. The evidence of things not seen in the natural. And that's why it says um, in Genesis 15, the Lord brought him forth abroad. The Lord brought him out. The Lord brought him out of, in his heart. The Lord 
the Lord brought Abram's heart out of being governed by the natural, by what can be seen and understood with the natural, seen with the natural eye, understood with the natural brain, touched with the natural hand. The Lord did this. Man can't do this. Man can't, man cannot attain unto the wisdom of God. No, no. Man cannot attain unto the understanding of God. No. Man cannot attain, period. It's a miracle of God. The Lord brought him forth. I love that. Abroad. Brought him out. Brought his, directed his heart once again unto that which is above. Look now to the heavens and behold the increase. Behold the fullness that filleth, the fullness that cannot be measured by some natural means. So shall the seed be. And Abram saw the resurrection and he believed God. Abraham, Abram saw what natural mind, what natural eye could not see and what natural mind could not understand. And he believed God. Abram saw the substance of what cannot be seen with the natural eye, what cannot be seen in the natural. And this is faith. Okay? So that's just that passage right there. I, I love it. Uh, we're going to see if we can, because my time's running out here, we're going to see if we can just look at a couple other passages, <clears throat> excuse me, also, that are basically declaring the same thing. And once again, it's not God giving a response to every different situation. No, it is God declaring purpose in every situation. Declaring He only has one purpose. He only has one, one purpose, one will, one goal, one everything, okay? And it's not so much that God needs uh, to accomplish something that the Son has not already accomplished, no. Jesus has finished all things. On the cross, he said, it is consummated. That's what he said, you can search it out. When he says, it is finished, it is consummated. Brought unto consummation in his death, burial, resurrection, right then and there. The Son, the risen, the risen Son, the risen Lord, sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down. The, no more work to be done. No more work to be done. Uh, looking at a testimony of this, you can see the high priest. The high priest is continually ministering because the, the work is never finished. But uh, the writer of Hebrews says, this man, by one offering, he completed forever with one offering and he sat down at the right hand of God and God is satisfied. No man can do this except one, all right? What does God have to do now? Nothing. The Son has accomplished all. All that God desires to do now is make known this Son in the soul. Make known this son unto the soul. That's it. God doesn't have to do anything. It is finished. And yet he desires to show the one who's present. That's it. So that's what I mean by when I, when I say purpose, goal. It's not that God has to come to some goal, like God has a goal. No, God has come to his goal in his son's death, burial, and resurrection. The glorified seed, now resurrection, the seed glorified Christ, the risen Lord. It, it is what God the Father was after from the beginning. It is what God the Father has now, and he is satisfied. And now he has nothing more to do but it pleases him to reveal the Son, the resurrection himself. All right, so this is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha, I love this, 
You can underline this if you have your uh, notes, or you can use pencil colors in your Bible. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. I like this. I, I, I like, I love the wording that's used. She received him unto her house, in to her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Once again, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, and the word of the Lord came unto him. And here's Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. And remember, when we hear the word of the Lord, it's with purpose. When we hear God speak, God speaks to the heart, but God speaks to the heart with purpose so that the heart may turn to behold the voice. In the heart turning to behold the voice, God now declares his perfect word. God makes known his perfect word. God reveals his perfect word, his logos, his logos, by revealing, him, by revealing his son, by making known his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's a beautiful order. It's a beautiful order of the Spirit. Verse 40, But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? And uh, in, in one of the Spanish translations, the I guess the Living Translation in Spanish, the New Living Translation in Spanish, uh, when Jesus responds, and Jesus, verse 41, and Jesus answered, it says, my appreciated Martha. It's like he appreciated her efforts. He appreciated all that she was doing for him. She appreciated it. It wasn't like, ah, oh, well, why are you doing that or why are you doing this? No, her heart was to serve the Lord. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. With man, it's always many. When the object of the heart of man is not Christ himself, then it is many. You are careful and troubled about many things, verse 42, but one is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary hath chosen the good. That good part, and once again, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses like 3 and 4, God said, let there be light, and God saw the light, that it was good. So here's Mary, and all she is doing is hearing the word of the Lord, hearing Jesus speak, hearing his word. And his word being spoken into the heart is spoken with purpose that the heart may turn to behold the voice. And, oh my gosh, as I stated it from the beginning of the class, I, I, I declare this to Bible school students, to students that when they graduate, 95 to 100% of the graduates will be in full-time ministry. I mean, they're in Bible school. They're being prepared the one thing that we do not understand, whether we are in Bible school and we are a Bible school student, or whether we in, are in seminary and being prepared, or, we're, or if we are not a student and yet search the scriptures to learn the Lord, or shall I say to learn about the Lord. 
The one thing we do not know, that we do not realize, is that we cannot serve the Lord. In all truth, in all reality, we cannot serve him. I was thinking about this passage uh, earlier today. Once again, Joshua. Joshua, Joshua says this, Choose ye this, this day whom ye will serve. And all Israel, all the whole entire body says this, we will serve the Lord. Joshua's response, you cannot serve the Lord. And then Joshua goes on and he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Lord speaking to Moses to speak to, to, speak to Pharaoh, he says this, tell Pharaoh to let uh, oh, tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son. Seeing uh, Israel, the people Israel, as one, a testimony of Christ. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Let my son go that he may serve me. And then we hear Jesus speaking this, I always do those things that please my father. My father hath not left me, for I always do those things that please him. It's the son who serves his father. With us, we are just ignorant of the one who's present. We are ignorant of the son. So within us, there is this desire to serve the Lord. We are just ignorant because that desire is the son's desire in us. And why do I say that? Because at the moment of new birth, the great change of the ages has taken place in the soul. And the change is simply this, not I, but Christ who is now present. Therefore, the heart that loves the Lord is present. The heart that wants to serve the Lord is present. Because the life of these is Christ himself. One is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. That's it. Not all the hustle and bustle down here, not everything that you're doing or not doing, or what that others are helping you do or not helping you do. No. It is whether your heart is being prepared to turn unto the Lord or not. Whether you are coming to a place in your heart where you are hearing the word of the Lord so that you may turn to see the voice that speaketh unto your heart. And when your heart does turn to see the voice that speaks unto your heart, that you may behold him who is present, the Father, God himself, declaring, revealing, making known his perfect word in the soul. This is what it's all about. This is it. This is it. This is the vocation of the ages. This is the vocation of the heavenlies. This is the heavenly vocation, the heavenly call the heavenly calling, the heavenly vocation, the eternal vocation, beholding him who is present. It's nothing else. It's very simple. That's it. You remember once again, Jesus declared it in, the, in one of the gospels. He said, the purpose for those who come into the house and those who are in the house is to see the light of the house, who is Christ himself. Nothing more. That's it. That's it. Okay, uh, I know I'm running out of time, but let's just take a look real quick at uh, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 23. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitude away, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitude away, the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch 
of the night, Jesus came unto them walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear, because they knew not who it was. Verse 27, But straightway Jesus spoke unto them. Here we go again. Jesus speaking it's his word. Jesus speaking his word, the voice, the voice speaking, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Don't you love it? I am. It is I. And be not afraid. Or, it is I, be not afraid. Verse 28, And Peter answered and said unto him, and said, to, and said, Lord, if it be thou, if it's you, bid me come unto you. Don't you hear the, listen to the order of the Spirit. Jesus speaks in the midst of all this chaos happening. They have no clue who it is. They have no clue the Lord is present. And yet Jesus speaks with purpose. He speaks his word with purpose. And Peter responds, Lord, if it is you, bid me come unto thee on the water. Don't you love that? The Lord speaks with purpose. The heart of Peter responds in purpose to come unto the Lord. Verse 30, oh, excuse me, verse 29, and he said, come. It is I, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus, to come to Jesus, uh, turn the heart unto the Lord. And see, I know that everybody gets excited about Peter walking on the water, and then everybody starts declaring, and you can walk on the water, I can walk on the water, we can walk in the water, thinking that the whole object of this whole passage is about walking on water. No. The whole object, the whole purpose, the whole theme of this passage is coming unto Jesus, is hearing his voice, turning to see the voice, and coming to behold the voice. The heart turning unto the Lord. This is what it's all about, remember? They are they that testify of me. Actually, it says in Spanish, Santa Biblia, in the Holy Bible. They are they that testify of me and you will not come to me. Designed of God with one purpose, to come unto his son. I love this. He walked on the water to go to Jesus, to come to Jesus. Get thee out from thy land, from thy kindred, and come unto a land I will show thee, and come unto a land I will show thee. And the land that God shows, shows, makes known, is the land that is filled with his glory. The land that is filled with himself. But, verse 30, when Peter saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. See, how can you, even in the natural, let's just look at a natural example. How can you come to a person except you see their face or except you hear them calling you? Your whole heart is directed unto a voice, unto a person, unto the face, and then you can go forward to come unto that person. You're beholding your, their face. You're not beholding anything else. You're beholding their face. When you begin to behold something less, then you're not beholding them. Therefore, you are not coming to them any longer. And that's exactly what happened here in verse 30. But when he saw, when Peter began to see the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. His gaze fell like Abram's. Verse 31, I love this. And immediately, 
and immediately. Peter, in type, was coming to purpose because he was coming to the Lord. He was coming to Jesus. He was coming to, to, to Christ himself in type. His heart was being directed unto the Lord. And when he recognized that he was no longer coming unto the Lord, that his heart was now caught up with something less, he cries out, Lord, save me. And I love this, verse 31, and immediately, and that's the way it should be. When, when at whatever moment we recognize that our heart is not turned unto the Lord, at that very moment we should begin crying out to the Lord, Lord, turn my heart unto thy salvation, to behold thy salvation, that my heart may stand still and behold the salvation of the Lord. Turn my heart unto the face of Christ. Turn my heart that you may reveal him who is in the midst, whom I see not, therefore whom I know not. Let it please you, Father, to reveal your Son in me, that I may know him. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. Why, Why does he say, O thou of little faith? Because for a moment, you were beholding me and the impossible was happening. What is impossible with man was happening. And then you began beholding something less and in beholding less, there is no faith. Faith, remember Hebrews, we read it a while ago, Hebrews 11 chapter one, or chapter 11 verse one. Faith is the substance of that which was hoped for, the evidence of that which cannot be seen in the natural. Faith is beholding the substance. Faith is beholding Christ himself, who you cannot see with the natural, the natural eye. This is faith. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they, were, then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying of a truth, thou art the Son of God. But it is written right there to show us this, that one is needful to hear his word, that his word have place in our heart because he speaks his word with purpose, that the heart may hear the word of the Lord, that the heart may turn to behold, listen, the word of the Lord that the heart may turn to behold the voice that speaks unto our heart. And in our heart turning unto the voice, turning unto Christ, turning unto him, or as the scriptures would say, coming unto Jesus, coming unto him, the Father makes known his perfect word. The Father makes known, reveals, makes manifest, his perfect word, his perfect logos, his perfect logos in the soul. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father revealing his son in the soul. This is what it is all about. The continual preparation of our heart by the spirit of the Lord that our heart may turn again and again and again and again until our heart may be steadfast in beholding and continue steadfast with the steadfastness of the Lord, beholding him who is present. Just where, where the heart can declare just like Elijah or Elisha, the Lord liveth before whom I stand, before whom I remain. The Lord liveth, not I, the Lord liveth, before whom I remain, before whose face I stand, before whose face I remain. So it's what it's all about in all the scripture. Anytime our, our heart gets caught up with something less, 
the Lord is faithful. God is faithful to turn our hearts back unto the Son again. The Spirit of the Lord is faithful to direct our hearts unto the truth, who Christ is. God is faithful. He's faithful to do this. Faithful is he who hath begun the good work. That the heart may continue to behold the one who is present. And this is good. So, we'll end for this class. Sorry that I kept you uh, late. I went a couple minutes over. But um, it's all I wanted to share during this class. And the Lord is faithful to do this time and time and time again. <clears throat> because he loves making known. It pleases God to make known him who is present in the midst. So, with that, I'll let you all go. Uh, Open your hearts to the Lord. Let the Lord accomplish, listen, let the Lord accomplish his good pleasure in our hearts. May the Lord accomplish his will in our hearts that he desires. He's already accomplished his will, but may it be so in our hearts. Amen? Amen. We'll let you go for this class. The Lord bless you. We'll see you in our next class. Amen.